imprisonment, accusation, it keeps going. He's, he's going off to another king to make his case. And Paul's using every opportunity that he has, every bad circumstance that he has, every imprisonment that he has, everywhere he goes, he's using it to build God's kingdom. Let's check it out. Hey, welcome to Bible Time, everybody. The place that we read the Bible and we get fed from the Word of God. We spend time seeking the Lord because especially in this season, but in every season, He's worthy to be sought after. The The Bible teaches us and tells us, promises us, that when we seek Him with all of our heart, then He will be found by us. And I don't know about you, but in seasons like this, I'm reminded how much I need Him. And I hope that you are. I hope that our world knows that too, can get that, can get that in their hearts. Uh, so anyway, this is Bible time. We just read the Bible together, and it's a fun time. And um, the Word of God is alive. It's powerful. It's life-changing. It's food for our soul. And so we get a chance to see it and hear it together. And I'll share my thoughts along the way. But we're going to jump into Acts chapter 23. Where What's going on here is the Apostle Paul, he's been told, if you go to Jerusalem, it's going to be bad news. He's like, I know I'm supposed to go. He's going. He gets arrested. He starts to get beaten. Uh, the Jews are after him. They want to kill him. Now the Romans have him in custody. They're about ready to whip him. And he says, hey, are you allowed to whip somebody without a trial who's a, a Roman citizen? And they're like, oh, whoa, you're a Roman citizen. So they stop. And then here we are the next day. They're like, let's bring everybody together. We want to know exactly why are you getting, uh, you know, why are they calling you out like this? And so this is, this is the council all come together, including the Jews and the Roman leaders. And Paul has this opportunity to speak to them and to describe what it is that's going on. So let's see what happens. It says that uh, looking intently at the council, that's Paul, looking at all the people, he said, brothers... I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Sorry. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. It's like a way of saying, you look good on the outside, but on the inside you're, you're dead. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you ordered me, me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that that was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak e evil of the ruler over your people. Interesting back and forth here where uh, the high priest commands something that you know Paul thinks is against the law, calls him out, and then, he says, oh, I'm sorry, because the law tells me I shouldn't speak bad of you. Anyway, it continues. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out to the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. It is with respect to the hope of the resurrection from the dead that I am on trial. So, this right here is like one of the primary dividing lines between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They're both religious leaders, uh, both Jewish, um, you know, would have been considered like the the spiritual leaders of the time, the pastors, the those that ran, you know, the religious system. But they had a few disagreements, and one of them was that the Pharisees believed that there would be a resurrection, an afterlife, and the Sadducees did not. And so I think that what this passage is trying to imply is that Paul recognized, you know, who was in the room and that if he said this, it would create a disturbance among them and that there would become an argument. And so um, I don't know if he was thinking, you know, take the attention off me for a minute, but that's what happens. So because it says he perceived that they were both in the room so then he said, hey, it's with respect to the hope of the resurrection from the dead that I'm on trial. And when he said this, a dissension arose among the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So there it is. Those are the three things. Resurrection, angels, or spirits. But Pharisees acknowledge all of those. 
Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes and the Pharisees party in the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? So it's funny, like you know, it's it, it seems like maybe this was a strategy. Uh, really relate with one half of the people there, create this dissension, so then that half of the people uh, sort of are inclined towards you, and maybe in order to prove the other guys wrong, they say, oh, well, he is good, and you know, and so that's exactly what happened. He said, I'm a Pharisee, and I believe in the resurrection. Excuse me. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, the Pharisees there say, hey, we don't find anything wrong with him. Uh, and then they specifically reference that maybe a spirit, <laughs> something the Pharisees don't believe in, or an angel, something the Pharisees don't believe in, spoke to him about the resurrection, something the Pharisees don't believe in. So, uh, you know, it's a little strategy that Paul's using here, and it seems to be working thus far. And when the dissension became violent, the, tr- the tribune... Afraid of Paul, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. This is a big deal. Because, well, number one, Jesus shows up to him again. Uh, but number two, it, it finally sort of gives us a little bit of like specifics as to why Paul uh, felt, even though a, a few people, even though one dude came down like hogtied him and was like, hey, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound like this. And, and yet he kept saying, I'm, I'm going, I have to go. And um, and so here's here's the sort of the sentence, I don't know, the declaration as to why in his spirit he knew, why the Holy Spirit was leading him to go there. And it was because though though it was going to be difficult, though he was going to face hardship, imprisonment, beatings, all of those things along the way, that Jesus wanted him to have courage and that he was pleased with his testimony and that he wanted him to testify also in Rome. I mean, think about it. Uh, Jerusalem being the center of the the religious world, as it were, for, at least for the Israelites, and then uh, Rome being the center of, you know, the kingdom. Sorry. I'm tired lately. I wonder why. Um, and so he wanted him to go to testify in Rome. He wanted him to go and um, proclaim proclaim the message of the gospel in the very center of this, uh, this, you know, kingdom. And so, let's continue. Verse 12, when it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Ouch. There are more than 40 who made this conspiracy. Then they went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves with an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now the son of Paul's sister heard, heard of the ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul, Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than forty of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves to an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. 
and now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, Tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Then he sent and called two centurions and said, Get ready two hundred soldiers with seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Man, that's a big army for one dude. You're like, I'm really going to protect this guy. Also, provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote this letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against this man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. An Antipatris. And on the next day they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul before him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from, and when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive, and he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some of the elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul, and when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since through your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation. In every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. So this is just really buttering up this Roman leader. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews joined in the charge, affirming all the, that these things were so. And when the governor had nodded to, for him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge of this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify it is not more than twelve days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disturbing with any one or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogue or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, again, the term of those that follow Jesus, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets having hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains and have a clear conscience towards both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or, or tumult, but some Jews from Asia... They ought to be here before you to make the accusation, should they have anything against me. Or else, let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this, one thing that I cried out while I was standing among them, it is with, with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. So he's making this case. But Felix, having rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide the case. And when he gave orders 
to the centurion that he should be kept in custody but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was, a, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about the faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get the opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. And when two years had elapsed, elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius? Porcius? Porcius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Whew. Well, we should probably end that in this for today, but... Um, lots going on. Spend, spending a lot of time in prison, being held up in the bureaucracy. Uh, bu bureaucracy? I think that's the right word. Held up in the system and all the, the steps that it takes to either accuse or clear somebody. Um, and so, man, there's there's a, you know, it's a history. It's, a, it's, it's less of a teaching and more of a this is what happened to him. But as for me, in my life right now, and the things that, that uh, you know, I'm going through, and a lot of us are going through, um, I just can't help but, but draw from this word. Uh, number one, just a thankfulness for the life that I have, and um, being reminded to, to just be thankful for, you know, the country that I live in, and the freedom that I have, and the lack of persecution that I face. And, and also this charge, uh, challenge to, to be ready that no matter what I face is, is my faith going to stay as strong as it is right now? You know, no matter if I'm persecuted, no matter if people throw me in jail, no matter if the economy crashes and I, and I lose everything, no matter whatever happens, am I going to be a person that keeps the faith and uses whichever situation I'm in to testify about Jesus. Paul, wherever he went, he used that opportunity and that circumstance to testify about Jesus. He goes over here and he's like, oh, cool. So I'm put in front of a more important leader to testify about Jesus. If I get sent to Rome, well, I'll go to Rome, the center of the kingdom, and I'll testify about Jesus. And and his, his whole heart was wherever he goes, whatever's taking place, he's going to use it to testify about the kingdom. And so that's the type of person that I want to be too. And uh, let's keep moving onward and upward. Let's, let's make sure in this season that we are staying in relationship with God and in relationship with others, if even by phone or FaceTime. Um, but onward and upward. Don't lose, the, don't lose hope. Don't lose the faith. Grow in your faith. Continue to pursue Christ. Grow in your relationship with Him and your obedience to Him. And He will prevail no matter what we face. God bless you.